Hi, Misha here, and we recently looked at, well, I looked at, and well, okay, I pointed a camera at, and I hope you join me, the Douglas A20 Havoc, or to our British friends, the Boston, and this is, or was in the other video, the A20 G variant, which was one of the attack, kind of, I like to call them gunship variants. Although this could be used as a light bomber for low and medium altitudes and was quite successful with nearly 7,500 made between 1940 and 1944. Today we're going to look at what Douglas designed to replace it to be a potentially better plane. This is the... Douglas A26, and this is the B, A26B, Invader. Later confusingly named the B26. But we'll get into that. This initially has a lot in common with the a20 Havoc and these two models are nice to compare together because they're both from Hobby Master both 172 die cast the A26 here is a newer production from Hobby Master but they're saying that they're not going to make any more and so who knows how much longer they'll be in stock at various places I did get this one from Pete's Collectibles. You know, I acquire a lot of stuff from him. Uh, his prices are fair. He's a friendly guy. He's always willing to help me out. So, if you could, you might check him out. I'll put a link in the description. And as always, if you use product code MISHA, you can get 15% off and a good deal on shipping. So anyway, on to the history ramblings of the Invader. The Havoc was kind of a little bit of an unexpected success for Douglas. So with that in mind, work began on a more modern plane to replace it in 1941. And World War II technology was very quickly progressing. So there was a lot of new stuff coming online then. One of the original designers... Ed Heinemann worked on the AX, excuse me, XA-26 project. A new, uh, a new individual in the works here who worked for Douglas uh, Smith would design a new wing, new wing geometry, which could provide uh, better lift, better range, better speed. So that was a major improvement with the new version. This was designed to have a much longer range because range was one of the shortcomings of the Havoc. And uh, the first prototype would fly in June of 1942 and be quite successful. The, it handled well, it was maneuverable. They had a few issues with like the landing gear and the engines overheating. Easy things to you know fix during uh, troubleshooting phase so no serious problems came up with uh, the the prototype so this quickly went into production now originally there were going to be the A26A which was a night fighter the A26B which was a ground attack gunship slash light bomber and the A26C which was to be a light bomber for low to medium altitudes. And the <clears throat> deal was the 26A, the night fighter variant, never went anywhere because the Northrop P61 Black Widow came online and uh, the 26A wasn't going to be any better than it, so it was basically canned. But the 26B and the 26C did go forward. And the way that Douglas designed these the main difference was in the nose. 
There were some other differences with the wing and the engines and fuel, but the main difference was the nose. And they made the nose on these modular. Which meant you could easily convert from a B to a C, or a C to a B, or back and back and back. The B variant would have six 50 caliber machine guns, later upgraded to eight in the nose. And obviously it would not have a bombardier compartment there. The C version would only have at first two 50 caliber machine guns, but it would have a what they call a greenhouse nose, so a glass nose for the bomber to aim. And it would have the, at the time, very advanced Norden bomb sight, so it could operate from medium altitudes. Later they would add a couple of extra guns, but it still wouldn't have the front armament of the B. And uh, actually there wouldn't be a dedicated bomber the uh, the A26 would have a crew of three. Pilot, of course, and then you had a navigator. Now, on the 26B, the navigator also doubled as a gunner. He could load, maintain the guns. On the 26C, he would double as the bombardier. He would basically crawl through a small little hatch under the uh, control panel there, under the front, into the nose, get into the little greenhouse bubble aim and then once that was done crawl back out and get, take a seat next to the pilot <clears throat> so he did double duty also the gentleman behind him would do double duty he was a radio operator and uh, kind of just did what needed doing on the plane And he also doubled as a gunner. And he operated two turrets remotely. These are electrically powered. I've also heard these called barbettes because they're not, strictly speaking, traditional turrets. The top turret had two 50 caliber machine guns, as would the bottom. And he would have a remote system with like a periscope and mirrors, and what was interesting is he would shift the point of aim up or down. Once it went past the center line, it would automatically flip him from controlling the top or the bottom turret. Barbette. So there was no one in the turret. He was up front. The system, while really slick and interesting for 1942 when it was first tried out, gave a lot of troubles, and uh, yeah, was kind of, a, I'd imagine, a bit disorienting for him as well. This plane is 50 feet long, has a wingspan of 70 feet, so it's dimensionally a little bit bigger than the Havoc, yet it was much faster. In fact, this was America's fastest bomber of World War II. It could get nearly to 360 miles per hour, and it could cruise at nearly 270 miles per hour. It had a max ceiling of about 28,000 feet, although that really depended on the loading. Speaking of, it could carry anywhere it could carry up to 4,000 bombs in internal bays and an additional 2,000 bombs torpedoes on external hard points of course this would always come at a cost it had a much greater range than the uh, Havoc when loaded up and everything properly it could get out to 1600 miles so about as great as anything in theater at the time not double but at least uh, half a yen as good as the Havoc. So they really tried to improve it. Still has two engines, could still fly with only one, of course decreased performance, but uh, there you go. The U.S. Army Air Corps, later U.S. Army Air Forces, would accept this in the summer of 1943 placing orders, and the 
first ones would be received in September of that year. And they would first be tried out in the Pacific in June of 1944. And they weren't liked. I can't even really say they didn't do all that great, but they weren't liked. People, they, they originally they were meant to replace the A-20 and even the B-25 pilots, but especially journals alike are famously quoted as saying they don't need or want anything to do with this plane out there. Just give them more A-20s. It's kind of funny because this had the extra range and speed you'd think, and it could be easily a bomber or a attack craft, but it just did not uh, did not impress out in the Pacific. So its service there was pretty uh, pretty limited. They would still fly these throughout 1944 and into 45, but the uh, the A20 and the B25 would continue to see service. Really didn't impress. Well, that was kind of a strike against Douglas. They had already diverted quite a bit of their manufacturing capacity, which they really didn't have time to do in the first place to make this. In fact, that's why it took a little while to get into production. They were making so many other planes. So this uh, came at a cost. And so if it wasn't successful, they were kind of really not making people happy. So they sent some of these over to Europe in September. And on their very first mission, they did great. None of them were lost. They achieved their objectives. Pilots liked them. The generals liked them. So in Europe, they were much better received. Of course, it's a much different environment. So more were stationed there in November of 44. And then more were stationed in Italy in 1945. And essentially, these groups of uh, A-26s were used to clean up pockets of German resistance, go after tanks, um, other armored columns, supply columns, troops, and just generally be close air support for the troops marching in on Germany, a role they were very well suited for. In fact, these could have a lot of machine guns on them. That's, there's lots of variations. You could attach more either in the wing panels or on pylons on the wings. It's worth pointing out my model here does not have a bottom turret or Barbette. It took me a little while to figure out why. I thought it might have been an error that uh, Hobby Master made, but actually, as it turns out, they would sometimes replace part of the internal bomb bay with fuel tanks, and this also necessitated replacing the, uh, the bottom turret, so they would remove it on some. So they would sacrifice 250 cals on the bottom, but they would acquire more range and lift capacity. So, that's why some of these would not have a bottom one. On the other hand, some versions could have as many as 22 50 caliber Browning machine guns with as much as 6,000 rounds of ammunition on board. It's said that if all, and they could all be pointed forward, or at least most of them, it was said if these were all fired that at once the whole plane would shudder and just get thrown back in the sky and actually endanger its flight, but it could be done. Also, the top turret could be locked in the forward position to complement the nose. The nose initially have six guns. Later, this would be upgraded to eight, as on this one here. And there you have that. This could also carry up to ten five-inch rockets, in case you needed some rockets. And, of course, it still had an internal bomb bay, which this model does represent as well. You can have the bomb bay open if you wish. So this would be used throughout the remainder of the war in 1945, and, of course, afterwards, you know, flown back home. Douglas would produce just over 2,500 between 1944 and 1945. Other orders were canceled because the Air Force felt it had all it needed, or Air Force is at that time. So only 2,500 were made. But they actually have a much longer history. Most of the other bombers we've covered so far, pretty much after World War II, that's it. Not so with the invader here. In 1947, of course, the Air Force went independent, became the U.S. Air Force, no longer under Army auspices. 
1948, they started renaming planes. They got rid of the Pursuit. They went to F for fighter. They also dropped the A designation. They had B, which made this the B-26. <laughs> the older Martin B-26 Marauder was still technically in service, but it was already considered an outdated obsolescent plane, and it was finally officially retired in 1950, making things a lot easier. Also in 1950, the Korean War kicked off, and the new named B-26 Invader was one of the very first aircraft to fly over South and eventually North Korea. In fact, these participated in the very first bombing raid of the war in June of 1929, June 29, excuse me, of 1950, in which they attacked a North Korean airfield. They would fly from bases in Japan, later they would fly from bases in South Korea, and they would prove instrumental early on in the war, destroying lots of ground targets, uh, trucks, railroad, rail cars, a lot of armor, even some planes on the ground. In November, the numbers of uh, B-26s would be upped, and they would continue to fly missions, both day and night. Although, starting in 51, they would go more and more to night missions, because by that point, more and more jet aircraft were in the skies. And, uh, well, that started to change the game. However, they would still remain in operation. In fact, they would fly the last bombing mission of the war before the armistice was signed in 1953. I believe it was, what, June 26 or June 27. They would uh, still be flying then, and, uh, yeah, they would drop a lot of ordnance on uh, North Korea. And their ground attack ability was, again, very much appreciated, and their range and speed, again, very much appreciated. They would still remain in front line Air Force Service until 1957, when they were effectively retired out of frontline service. And you would think that would be the end. Nope. In 1960, 1961, the CIA would take about 20 B-26 invaders from inventory and repaint, they would scrub them of identifiable marks, repaint them, and give them to Cuban exiles, Cuban rebels against the new communist government. And the first these would be flown in April of 61 against some Cuban airfields. And later, they would be used to try to cover the Bay of Pig invasions. It didn't go well. Uh, over half were shot down during these few operations, several people were killed, yada yada yada. CIA, good times. The, uh, the Air Force, especially the Tactical Air Command, would station the first B-26s in Thailand, so Southeast Asia, in uh, late 1960, and they would fly the first missions over Vietnam during Operation Farmgate in 1961. Now, they didn't want to say they were doing combat missions, even though they were doing combat missions. They did repaint these as Vietnam, South Vietnamese planes, and they named them RB-26s, so reconnaissance. But they were armed, and they participated in <laughs> combat. And they would continue to do so until early 1964 when they were pulled from flight after a few accidents. And then an investigation would ensue in April of 64. All B-26s would be grounded because what caused the accidents, they found out, uh, stress. The wings were basically fracturing and then they were cracking off. Uh, these were old planes at this point, you know, the 20 years old. They had seen uh, World War II, Korea, and even time in Southeast Asia. They were just wearing out. So they grounded them. The wings cracking off. That's it, right? Nope, because history won't let me just end the video there. 
there's still more to the history of this plane. In May of 19... I keep saying that. In May 30th of 1964, the B-26K first flew. Okay, the B-26K. Another variant. What happened... I, the Air Force contracted with Onmark Engineering to upgrade and retrofit B-26s from inventory to make them counter-insurgency planes, also known as the counter-invader. They would totally rebuild the wings, remanufacture the wings. They would add brand new engines, brand new modern propeller props, they would add uh, wingtip fuel tanks for more range, upgrade the avionics, upgrade the controls, refurbish, replace, and they would do this with um, 40, giving them all new serial numbers starting with 64 for the year. And these would be stationed in Thailand starting in 1966. Also, the CIA again would acquire some of the new B-26Ks and send them for their stuff in the Congo in Africa. So there's a little brief little blip there. Okay, more name confusion. We already went from A-26, B-C to B-26. Now we're going to go back to A-26A, since that designation was really never used. The U.S. government really, although the Air Force technically, renamed the B-26 the A-26A because of the Thailand, the Thai government. They did not want America operating bombers on their soil. So instead of just, you know, going with their wishes... They just renamed this back to an attack aircraft. Hey, it's not a bomber, right? And they would start flying these from 66 to 69, mostly over the Ho Chi Minh Trail to disrupt North Vietnam's supply line, using them as ground attack, and of course as a light bomber still, dropping ordnance. And they would even use a couple as a, kind of a night fighters or night interdictors, if you will. Okay, finally we're kind of getting to the end of this history. In 1969, even with the upgrades for the counter-invader, the B-26K, A-26A, the airframes are just reaching their maximum allowed hours in the sky. They were just, they were done. They were kaputs. They were old, and that's what it was. So they were voluntarily pulled from service before another accident could happen. But they had done their job in Vietnam. Some would be sent to the Air National Guard, where they would be flown for a few more years. But then they would be, the last one would be retired in 1972. So finally, we're at the end. A very long service for this plane. All things considered that there are only 2,500 and most other World War II planes of its vintage ilk era were long out of service. But I guess that's a testament to how forward-thinking and adaptable Douglas's design was. Even the Navy used some. As the JD-1 utility plane. But most were flown by the Air Corps, Air Forces, Air Force. And there we have it. Yet again, it kind of blurs the line between attack craft and light bomber, which it was intentionally meant to do. Kind of one of the first multi-role planes as well. It was tough and durable, just like the A-20 before it. It could really take a licking. And with so many machine guns on board, it could really dish it out, too. Well, guys, I think that's about it I can say about this Hobby Master model. There's no surprises. What I do like is it does come with a metal stand. 
at least the stem is metal so it's good and solid on there and it's kind of a cradle style as I said it does have a bomb bay that can be open or closed tricycle landing gear up or down turret does rotate it has the 8 gun nose they do have a few different versions of this. They do do the B-26K Counter Invader. They also have the version with both turrets. I went with this one because technically there's an error. The insignia on this plane isn't quite right for when it's supposed to be modeled. So because of that small boo-boo... Uh, I got it cheap, er, and I went with it, and Pete even sent me the correct decals if I wanted to put the right insignia on it, but I don't. Hey, I'm blind. I don't really care. <laughs> I like saving money more than I like having the exact right. I think it has the Air Force insignia instead of the Air Force's insignia that it should have, yada yada. However it goes. Doesn't matter to me. Uh, but, you know, because of that, I got a good deal on it. And it goes very nicely with this Havoc over here. Didn't actually get this one from Pete's. So he's been sold out for a while. This one actually came from Aiken's Airplane. Which is, I think, the only place that still has a few Havocs slash Bostons left. And that kind of gets us to the end of my uh, World War II bombers. Sorry I don't have a Martin B-26 Marauder. If I ever get one, you know, I'll do a video. But there you go, guys. Appreciate you tuning in. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you, if you didn't know about the A26, hope you learned a thing. If you did, I hope you found this a uh, apt tribute to this plane. By the way, the cockpit is openable, both in the front and the back, and uh, the crewmen do come out on this. Well, guys, I'm gonna go have dinner, so I will catch you very soon next time.